We'll be getting started shortly. Thanks for your patience. We'll get started in about five minutes. Thanks for your patience.
All right, uh, it's about 5.30, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for joining me this uh, afternoon. So before I share my screen and move forward with today's uh, material, I wanna open up the floor for any questions that you might have. So uh, simply unmute your mic and uh, share your question. Okay, I'll take that silence to mean that there aren't any questions. Uh, if at any point during our uh, material coverage today, uh, you feel you have a question for me, just simply unmute and uh, address your question. So what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and share my screen. So you should be seeing the course homepage could somebody just uh, unmute for me and verify that you are seeing that? Anybody? Are you seeing the home page? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, what I'm going to do now is go into the weekly overviews and we'll pick up where we left off on Monday. So on Monday, we got about as far as covering um, my notes packet dealing with 1D kinematics. But what we didn't get to do was look at the video for motion graphs. So I'm going to play that video for you. And uh, once that video is over, then we'll move forward. At Chewy, we believe feeling good comes first. That's why we offer veterinary diets. Sorry about that. I got to skip the ads. Welcome to the video lesson on physics motion graphs. The objective of this lesson one? is to understand the relationships Sorry, I thought I had a question out there. Did I have can a question? Turn the, can you turn the captions on? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'll start it over just to make sure. No worries. I appreciate it. Welcome to the video lesson on physics motion graphs. The objective of this lesson is to understand the relationships of distance time, velocity time, and acceleration time graphs and to be able to sketch those graphs for almost all the major types of motions that we'll see in this course. Let's start by taking a look at the types of graphs that we can draw and the information that we can get from them. We start with the distance or displacement or position, all the same thing with regards to the graphs. Uh, so distance, displacement, position versus time graphs. The symbol that we'll be using for uh, distance displacement position is X and the symbol that we'll use for time. So for us, the distance time graph will be an X versus T graph. What can we get from them? We can, of course, the easiest thing we can get is we can get the distance at any given time uh, just by um, uh, going down to the time axis going up to the best fit line and then over to the left, find out how far it's going, how far it's traveled at some given time. We can also get the average velocity from the slope of the straight line. Um, these two keywords go together, average velocity and slope on a distance time graph. And we can also get the instantaneous velocity from the slope of the tangent line to the curve at that point. So if our best fit line is not a straight line and it's a curve instead, we, you can see how we can't get average velocity from that because the velocity is changing, but we would be able to use a tangent line and get the instantaneous velocity using the slope of the tangent. And I'll demonstrate that for you later. Our next type of graph is the velocity or speed. And the same symbol we use for that is V versus time graphs, again, T. 
So VT graph. And what can we get from those? The easiest, of course, again, velocity time graph is the velocity at any given time. Um, similarly, and uh, one thing that is commonly tested is finding the displacement of the object by finding the area between the line and the time axis. Okay, they really like to test that one. Okay. Our last type of graph is the acceleration versus time graph. Our symbol for acceleration is A and, of course, versus T. So these would be AT graphs. And what can we get from them? Only the acceleration at any given time. They are the most limited um, type of grip motion graph that we can get as far as the information we can attain from them. And again, I'll demonstrate this for you as we start to do the various graphs for all the types of motion. Let's move on to that and let's take a look at what we're going to do for each of these uh, motion scenarios or situations. We're going to draw the XT, VT, and AT graph, one right under the other, um, so that we have a good understanding of the differences between the graphs and what they communicate to us. So we're going to start with an object at rest. We're going to start easy and work our way towards the harder scenarios. So for an object at rest, if an object is just standing there, that means that its position wouldn't be changing. And as time goes forward, so you could pick any spot. And what this of course means is that the distance is not getting bigger or smaller as time progresses, okay? Well, if an object is at rest, that means its velocity is zero and where the time axis intersects here on the uh, y axis would be where time, uh, where velocity is zero. So we would have a VT graph that has a horizontal straight line on the time axis. If there's no velocity, there's no acceleration. So it also has a zero AT graph, a horizontal line on the time axis. Okay? We now go to an object moving at constant velocity away. What does that mean? That means the, the uh, velocity is constant, but the distance is increasing over time. So this, of course, would be uh, a straight line uh, sloped upward. And this, if you take a look, the X numbers are getting bigger. While time is moving in a positive direction, it's the only direction time can move. Okay. And the fact that the line is straight means that the rate of change of the displacement or distance is staying constant. And of course, that means constant velocity. If that's true, then on our VT graph, we're going to have some non zero velocity over that same time interval. And it should be obvious to us that that velocity remains constant. You notice here that this horizontal line is above the time axis. The slope of this line is positive up here on the XT graph. So our velocity is positive on our VT graph. We still are not accelerating. This object is not speeding up or slowing down. So its acceleration value is zero. So this would be a horizontal line on the time axis. Moving on to our next scenario, object moving at constant velocity toward. Well, constant velocity means our line is going to be straight. Toward means that our X numbers, our distance numbers are going to be decreasing. So this would be a um, straight line, negatively sloped, showing that our X value is decreasing as time is increasing. Straight line indicating to us that the rate of change of that distance is remaining constant, therefore constant velocity. Well, constant velocity again means that we're gonna have a horizontal straight line. This time though, our horizontal straight line is below the time axis. 
The slope of this line is negative, indicating negative velocity, meaning that it's going toward. So the first lesson we pick up here on VT graphs is that when your line is above the time axis for a VT graph, that means the object is moving away from the point of origin. And when the line is below the VT graph, the object is moving toward the point of origin. Huge point for you to remember there. Our object is still not accelerating, so its A value is zero. So again, we have a horizontal line on the time axis at which A equals zero. Okay, next we go constant, um, object moving at constant acceleration away. That means this object is speeding up and if it's moving away from the point of origin, that the X numbers, the distance numbers are getting larger. This will result in a curved line that looks something like that and um, curved upward means that it's getting faster. I'll demonstrate for why for you here in a second and uh, a way indicated by the fact that the X numbers are getting bigger as time increases. Okay, now, why is this a curved upward line like this, and not a curved upward line like I just demonstrated with the pen, okay? If we take our tangent line, which I'm gonna grab a tangent line down here and bring it up, We start out at the beginning here. Tangent line being the line that touches the curve only in one spot. You can see that at this particular spot, the slope of this tangent line would be zero. So this object had started from rest. However, when we go here and we draw our tangent line, now we have a positive slope for that tangent line, what does that mean? Positive velocity means the object has gotten faster. When we move upwards and higher on the graph, what's happening to our tangent line? Our tangent line slope is getting steeper. That means the speed is increasing. That means our object is accelerating. If we were to do the other line, and we'll have that scenario later, you would see that the slope would be decreasing showing that the velocity is decreasing, okay? All right, object moving, constant acceleration away. So that is going to be a straight line on our velocity graph, positively sloped. And that would indicate to us, of course, that the velocity is increasing over at a constant rate therefore constant acceleration. And as we reviewed earlier, it's above the T-axis indicating to us that the object is moving away from the point of origin. Now we do have a non-zero A value. And because this, the slope of this line is positive, that would be positive acceleration. So whatever that acceleration would be, would be the Y-intercept for this line, okay, and a horizontal line. So I just want to pause it right here just for a moment because I want you to pay particular attention to the difference in the graphs when the object has a constant velocity and the acceleration is zero versus a constant acceleration. The acceleration is not zero and the velocity increases uniformly, okay? So um, these graphs, although this is distance and time, velocity and time, acceleration and time, in each setup, notice how the graphs differ, okay? This is where it becomes critical that you understand the difference between velocity and acceleration. Because constant velocity means 
the acceleration is zero because the object is not speeding up or slowing down. Constant acceleration means the velocity is changing uniformly with time, okay? And when you work on problem set number three A, you are going to be using a simulator to practice looking at these types of graphs, okay? And you'll be looking at uh, the relationship between position, velocity, acceleration, and time as you manipulate the values, the input values for the- I have, a, I have yeah. a question. Please go right ahead. Do you mean, um... What's the difference between average velocity and average speed over time? Uh, yes. Can you explain that a little bit more? I can absolutely do that, right? And, and just looking at the graph, it might not be readily evident the difference, right? So you have to go back to our definitions on Monday. Velocity is a vector that involves direction. Speed is a scalar that does not involve direction. Velocity looks at how the displacement is changing with time. It, while speed looks at, well, excuse, speed looks at how the distance is changing for you per so unit time. Okay, so two different properties. Velocity relies on displacement Speed relies on distance. And if you say average values, remember I talked about on Monday, the difference between average looking at an entire trip, whether you're looking at velocity or speed. Average refers to the entire trip, whereas instantaneous refers to a moment during the trip. Yes, thank you so much. That's way clearer. Thank you. Not a problem. I, and I know that can be a little bit tricky because on the graphs, you can, you can use X to represent position, distance, or displacement. And so that, that is a little bit tricky because the graph is actually, you, then you can infer that you can use the graph to do speed or velocity. So it's a little bit tricky, but you just have to remember the, the, the difference in that terminology. Okay. Is it okay to move forward now? Cool. All right. So I'm gonna start the video again and we'll look at um, the object moving at constant acceleration toward, and then we're gonna That'll be it. We won't go into uh, anything any more complicated than that. Above the t-axis because acceleration is positive. Going to our next scenario, object moving at constant acceleration toward, okay? This of course means that the speed is increasing, but we're losing distance, getting closer to the point of origin, okay? So this line would look something like this, slope downward, try to draw a better curve than I can with my pen here on the screen, okay? For the VT graph, sorry about that, for the VT graph, Constant acceleration means uh, we're going to have um, start from rest and get faster. So the V numbers have to be getting bigger, but we're moving toward the point of origin. So we're below the time axis. So our V number is getting bigger, but being below the line means our line is sloped downward like this. Notice that the V number is getting bigger, meaning constant acceleration toward below the time axis. Here we have a negatively sloped line 
the slope of this is the acceleration, of course. So our acceleration would be a straight horizontal line below the time axis. Okay, so I want to clarify for you um, something that he said in the video, okay? Especially on this one, because this one looks sometimes counter to your intuition. So we know that the object is accelerating because the on the position versus time curve, you have a curve instead of a straight line, okay? It is the curve downward that tells us that the object is moving toward. Now, notice on the video, he used the language that the velocity is getting bigger. If you think of it this way, it is getting bigger, but more negative, right? Because you think about if you extend this arrow downward, these values are getting more and more negative, but larger, right? And so that's what I wanted to clarify for you. When he's, cause sometimes people think negative means less than. When he says that, he's not necessarily conveying less than, he's conveying that the, 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 the size, if you will, is getting bigger, but it's, you know, in a more negative sense of the word, okay? Um, so that, and that also corresponds to the fact that the acceleration is negative. Remember, we said on Monday that acceleration can be positive or negative, and we're choosing the simpler cases where if the acceleration is positive, you're speeding up. So V would be, you know, increasing on the top side of the graph, right? But in this case, you have a negative acceleration. And I said, what? Negative acceleration means um, you're hitting the brakes, right? So you can think of it in that sense of the word, all right? So those are the examples of the motion graphs that I wanted to share with you. We won't do these values over here because that gets a little bit more complicated than I want you to have to deal with at this level of a course, okay? So um, um, that's basically all I wanted to share with you on the motion graphs. And you will get an opportunity to practice with motion graphs on problem set number 3A, okay? And it goes without saying that at any point, if you're working on uh, problem set 3A and you're having questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me, okay? It's real important to me that you understand that we can describe a moving object with equations. And we saw those equations on Monday, the equations of motion for constant acceleration. And I showed you what those equations look like for an object moving horizontally or vertically in free fall. Now I wanted you to see here today that you can also describe moving objects using graphs. Notice we don't have any numbers on these graphs. And just by looking at them, we can tell what type of motion the object is exhibiting. All right, so I'm gonna close this now. And just to remind you, you can get to that right here in the required readings viewings in this week's overview on 1D motion. Those motion graph videos, so you can go back and watch them over and over if you need to, um, especially while you're working on problem set uh, 3A uh, on uh, this weekend, you know, because that's going to be due on, uh, on Saturday. All right. So uh, I, I thought it might be wise if I took a moment and worked an example or two utilizing those equations of motion. Okay. Because, um, well, you, you'll have to do some of that as well on problem set number 3B. So I thought only in fairness, I should at least work one or two examples before we move on 
to any additional material, okay? And please, at any point while I'm working these problems, if you have questions, stop me because I wanna make sure that you follow along with what we're doing, okay? And so um, I pulled up some sample problems by simply going to useful links. I clicked on useful links, here it is. And I'm going to one of my old faithful websites as I call it, the physics classroom, it's a tutorial site. So I said, well, you know, students might want to use this site. So let me go out and show them, kind of show them what's out there and, and, and use it to work an example or two regarding 1D motion, all right? So I love this site because um, all of the topic areas that we cover in this class and then some are represented on this website, the physics tutorial, okay? Uh, the physics classroom tutorial site, all right? And so um, let's take a look at some of, uh, a couple of sample problems that they have that utilize the equations of motion, all right? So, and, and the other nice thing about this website is that, um, they do have the solutions for you, okay? So, you know, what I suggest to you is that you try it and then check yourself utilizing the solutions, right? Okay? And I tell students, you know, it, it's okay that you, you, you know, you feel compelled. Okay, let me check and see if I did it correct. That's exact, exactly what you need to do especially at the beginning stages, because that helps you to develop some confidence that you understand the material, okay? So I'm gonna look at, um, I'm gonna look at um, um, this, this first question. Uh, and then I will find one that deals with free fall and we will do that one as well, okay? So some horizontal motion and a, uh, an example with some um, free fall motion. So this question number one says, an airplane accelerates down a runway at 3.20 meters per second squared for 32.8 seconds until it, I think they meant to put it, finally lifts off the ground. Determine the distance traveled before takeoff, okay? So now let's go back and refresh ourselves on those equations of motion, okay? And um, let me see. I, I know that I wrote those out for you on Monday, but let's just do it again. I got to. Okay. So I'm just bringing up a whiteboard here, okay? And I'll be sure to save these for you. I'll save these for you. In fact, I gotta go back and find the one that I did on Monday with the equations and put it in the announcements for you. All right. So let's see if I can just copy that and insert it. I don't know if I can, ah, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so there we go. So now I'm gonna, let me move this. Sorry, I'm just adjusting my screen a little bit. Mm. Okay, there we go. All right, so, so we know from this that we have the acceleration given. See, and it's important that you look at what information you have given and also what information you're being asked to find. Okay. 
And they want us to find here the distance at the end. Okay. So now I'll write up here on the top for you the equations of motion. And I'm just going to focus on the three main ones that I shared with you on Monday. Uh, you saw there were different ones in the lecture notes packet. But remember, I told you when I wrote them out on the whiteboard that there are three that we primarily focus on. And so um, let me do that. OK. And so I'm going to write them out for you. And then we're gonna we're gonna work together to try to figure out which one we need to utilize. Oh, sorry, my my penmanship is not the greatest on this thing here. All right, so thanks for your for indulging me on that. The, um, though these are our equations of motion, and so we can see very clearly from what they've asked us to find the final. You can think of it this way: if we want to find out how far it went, then we have to know where did it stop and where did it start, right? OK, um, and so we can see right away that that will that will um, like we can't use this one. Right. This one's not going to work for us. And also uh, this one is not going to work for us because they gave us time. Remember, this equation is only helpful if you're trying to solve for a parameter and you don't know the time. OK. So this one won't buy us anything because there's no X final in it. And this one won't help us because there's no T in it. So that means that this is the one that we have to use here. OK. All right. So now, if you notice in this equation, um, well, we, we remember we talked about this idea of a reference frame, right? Where are you starting from? So in this particular case, it's convenient for us to choose our starting value for the position as zero, right? And it's also, uh, you know, pretty commonplace if the airplane is taking off, uh, you know, uh, uh, until it lifts off the ground, that it starts with a, a velocity of zero, right? I mean, we are hoping you're not trying to jump onto a moving aircraft, right? So this aircraft on the ground starts off with this velocity as zero, okay? Now, you know, um, I, I always tell students that you have to use your everyday um, intuition a lot of times to help you, especially when it comes to those starting parameters that won't always be explicitly given, right? Like the starting position being zero and a starting velocity being zero. Your intuition tells you that, you know, that makes sense. Okay, if you're gonna measure how far, you gotta start from somewhere, why not start from zero? 
okay? It just makes it a whole lot easier. And so if we do that, in fact, if we look at this equation, then it means that we can X out this value because it start at zero and we can X out this value because if we take zero times T, we get zero, right? So then that tells us from this that our, our final value has to equal to one half A T squared, okay? So now let's just substitute one half a, which is 3.20. And uh, I make it a habit of when I'm just substituting, I don't have to put the unit in there. Um, you can if it makes things clearer for you. But uh, I, you know, when I have all the units in there while I'm trying to calculate, sometimes that can kind of uh, throw you off a bit. So then just, you know, remember that in the end, because in you are finding the, the distance travel, that has to be measured in meters, okay? Okay, and so then we can get to the math, then it becomes a, a, a math thing, right? So I'm gonna pull out my handy dandy calculator here. Uh, and I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do the. I'm gonna do the 32.8 squared first. Okay, 32.8 times 32.8. Cause I don't have one of those fancy calculators where I can group things and all of that. Times 3.20, and then I'm gonna take half of that, and I get here and y'all correct me 1721.34 meters i always round off the two decimal points that is more than sufficient for anything we do uh we don't have to get into and, and I know a lot of times in science state, you want to get on the significant figures and all those kinds of things. We're not going to, you know, invest time doing that uh, because we can just round off the two decimal pla places and call it a day. Okay. So now I'm going to save that one for you. And I'll be sure to put this one in the, um, in the notes. When I post the video, I'll post these as well. Okay. So let's go and check ourselves and see if I, if, if, you know, if I got this one right. So I'll just go back to that and uh, I can simply see the solution. Okay. They round it off a little bit. They round it off a little bit. Um, but they they got seven, 1720. I, I got a little bit more because I didn't, you know, I didn't uh I didn't round off like that. It, it depends on what if if you know where you round at at what point you round. But I always tell students, and I, I get this question, so I'm gonna be very clear. The setup is what I would be looking at to determine if you understood the concept. If you rounded off to 1720 meters and I rounded off to 1721 meters, I'm not I'm not interested in beating you up over that over that at all. What I'm more interested in is did you know what did you understand what you're being asked to find? Did you utilize the correct formula, substitute incorrectly, and then the rounding issue at the end? I'm not that's you know, that would be uh to me being a bit picky okay now if you if you did this problem and you said 1700 meters i might be looking to see where you made a math mistake at okay 
because that's a little bit, that's a, you know, that's a 20 meters difference, which is, you know, reasonable to say somewhere that you made a math error. Okay. So um, on that particular example, do you have any questions on what we were asked to find, how I went about choosing which of the equations of motion to use, and then how I, you know, got to the point of substituting and getting my final answer. All right. Let's take a look at another example. Now this one, um, this one is dealing with free fall. So I wanna do this one here on Upton Chuck and let's see what he has going on today. So I'm gonna open another whiteboard Fox window. And okay. Okay, it would go a little bit slow because I'm just because I'm anxious for it to open. There we go. All right, and so I'm going to add text. All right. And so now, um, now we're going to an example of free fall. So it says here, Upton Chuck is riding the giant drop at Great America. I, I don't know. I, I imagine this is some type of a amusement ride thing where you fall. If Upton free falls for 2.60 seconds, what will be his final velocity and how far will he fall? Ah, okay. So now this is what we have to remember about our free fall scenario. Let me, let me, okay. So we're dealing- I have a question. Yes, go right ahead. Um, sorry. One moment, I'm asking. Yeah. The velocity? What's the velocity? So I'm Thank you. Okay. Uh I'm not sure I answered the question. I don't know what the question was. What's the uh, velocity? Does he mean what is the final velocity of this object? Because that's what we're solving for. One moment. Sure. So did, so are we clear, uh, do you have a better idea of the question? Because I want to make sure I don't miss it. One moment, he's writing it down. Okay, gotcha. We're good. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So now, uh, 
So while we were waiting there, I went ahead and, and, and put on the screen for you the equations of motion rewritten to accommodate free fall. Because remember, in this case, the acceleration of free fall is minus G, right? Okay. So I went back and everywhere I had X, I put a Y. And everywhere I had an A, I put minus G. And so these are free fall equations when we take into account the acceleration being produced by gravity, okay? So now we have to go back to this idea of what's being given to us, T equals, in this case, two, 0.60 seconds, okay? And also there are some very important things that we uh, can, can uh, utilize to our advantage. And that is A equals minus G equals nine, well, we can think of it this way. Let me just, let me write it like that because we already have in our equations, we've taken care of the substitute. We don't want to do it twice. Okay. So I'm just looking at the value that we need to substitute. Okay. For our acceleration. See, they don't have to tell us a value because we're on planet earth we know that the size of the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. And I've already taken care of the fact that the acceleration is a vector and the minus sign tells me that gravity pulls downward, right? So I took care of that in my formula already. So I don't have to do it twice, okay? Now, the other thing is that because this is a drop, that's a very important idea there. The fact that this is a drop that's taking care place at this uh, amusement park ride, um, that means that the starting velocity has to be zero. And we can take the starting position as zero, okay? You could look at it this way you could take the starting value as, as zero. And then remember, if this comes out negative, that means the object is falling down, right? So be mindful of that. Or you could take the final value as zero and then say uh, whatever the starting value is, is how high it started from, okay? You just have to think about that in the appropriate way. I always like to take wherever the object is starting from as my zero values. Okay. So now, uh, if we want to find the final velocity, then we can go right to this equation here because it will give us VF. Okay. So VF. Ooh. I make it so big there, equals V naught minus G T. And remember, in this equation, this is zero. So we get then is equal to here, minus 9.8. Times two point six. Oh, and that equals so then you multiply that out. Sometimes you'll see books that round off uh, this value of g to ten. Um, if you, if, as long as you indicated to me that's the value you were using, I wouldn't mark, I wouldn't mark, mark it wrong, because a lot of books do it. 
especially at an introductory level. So 25, oh, let me undo that. Minus, let me not forget my minus sign because that's very important, important on this, not minus 25.48, the unit for velocity, meters per second. If you write me just the number, I'm going to mark it wrong because you have to include the unit. The unit is most important here, okay? Because they're asking you to find the final velocity. Now, so now we know the final velocity, which tells us, and let me, let me explain something to you because you might be tempted to say, hey, when this object hits the ground, it's not gonna have a velocity. So the final velocity is gonna be zero. There is no physics once the object goes flat. So you, when they ask you to find the final value, they're always talking about just before it hits the ground. Okay. All right. So now we found the final velocity. And if we want to find out how far it falls, we can simply go to this equation here. Why? Because this goes away and this goes away. And I'm simply left with here. Y final equals, and I'll write it all out just to be thorough, plus V naught T minus one half G T squared. And so remember, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and so we're left with one half, don't forget that minus sign out there, one half 9.8, 2.6, which is our time, Ooh. Oh, definitely got to work on my pin dexterity there. Okay. So I'll do the 2.6. Guess I sh should put my zero there. 2.6. Okay. Times 9.8 divided by 2. So 33.123.12 meters. Now, remember, okay, they're asking us how far it would fall. Remember, this minus sign is telling us direction. The object is falling down. So if, they, if we want to know how far it will fall, you can simply say 33.12 meters, okay? All right, so in this particular case, Y final equals 33.12 meters. And honestly, if you solved it and got and, and left the minus sign in, I wouldn't beat you up because I understand, uh, you know, that you do understand how to solve the problem. But because they asked how far, technically, how far is just the number and the unit, okay? All right, so I'll, I'll catch capture this one for you and I'll save it. And let's see if I got it correct. Yeah. So they got um they got minus 25.5 meters per second. 
and I got minus 25.48. They round it. No big deal. Okay. And then here, uh, they, they did the distance part and they got negative 33.1 meters and they put in parentheses here what? The minus indicates direction, which is precisely what I was explaining to you that technically because they asked how far, we really only care about the 33.1 meters part of it. But, you know, again, we know that because um, this object is falling, the, the negative sign indicates direction. All right. So uh, any questions on this particular example? And these are the kinds of problems that uh, you'll come across on problem set 3B that you have to do this weekend. All right. So that takes care of our look at 1D motion. Um, let me just speak briefly on the vectors and 2D motion, okay? So um, this is one particular unit that I typically have students work through on their own independently, right? That's because I've introduced you to the concept of what are scalars and what are vectors. I've talked about some examples of scalars and vectors. We've even solved problems that utilize the idea of some properties being a vector and some being a scalar. So this material that you're gonna look at in the required readings, viewings, doesn't introduce anything new that I haven't covered already. And you will actually get a chance to do a discussion with your peers on vectors, where I ask some questions about what are vectors, give me examples, that type of thing, right? So, um, you, you just have to uh, keep in mind that, uh, you know, all of the properties that we're going to be dealing with are based on measurement. And those measured properties can either be scalar that doesn't have a direction or vector that does. Okay. So you will work through the vectors overview um, by utilizing the material that I've made available to you. I've already lectured on it. I did it Monday. All right. So what I want to do in the remaining time is I want to talk about this 2D motion. Okay. I want to talk about 2D motion. And um, I, I may give a little bit more time on this, on this particular problem. Uh, well, actually, you won't deal with this problem set until next week anyway. Um, because problem set number four is on vectors. So you won't have to do problem set number five on 2D motion until the 26th of June, not this Saturday, but the upcoming Saturday, all right? So you don't have to worry that, uh, you know, uh, about not being able to deal with the material in terms of a problem set. And I may go ahead and extend and give a little bit more time on the 2D discussion. I may extend it out until um, Tuesday. That way, um, you know, you can have a little bit more time to digest that and ask questions if you need to, since, uh, you know, um, we're going to, I'm going to start covering it now. And I'll probably finish it up on just finish it up on Monday. All right. So now, as far as the required readings viewings for this this topic area. So you have chapters four and six in the textbook. I pulled those out, put them right here because they relate to 2D motion. So you need to look at those items yourself. And if you have any questions, reach out to me and ask any questions that you have, okay? So there's also some videos that deal with 2D motion you want to take a look at those and then again, get back to me if you have any questions. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to um, introduce projectiles to you. And then on Monday, I'll, I'll put a bow on it and finish up 2D motion by looking at orbit motion <coughs> and uniform circular motion. 
but today I'll finish up today by taking a look at projectiles. Okay. So um, don't worry, I'll adjust the due dates on things so that you have adequate time. That's on me, that's not on you, okay? I tell everybody, I'm a little bit long-winded, so indulge me on that one, all right? So now we're gonna be looking at um, two-dimensional kin kinematics. So we looked at the basic definitions, equations of motion, free fall, which are all dealing with objects moving in one dimension, right? Now we want to extend that and say, well, what if our object is moving in two dimensions, okay? And so instead of our object moving horizontal or vertical, our object is now going to be moving horizontal and vertical doing both of those things simultaneously, okay? And to keep our understanding simple, you know, our, our investigation simple, we're gonna focus on two different types of moving objects. The one I'm gonna talk about today is a projectile. The one I'll talk about on Monday is an object moving in a circle, okay? So on Monday, we'll look at two-dimensional motion for an object moving in a circle. Today, for the rest of the time, we'll look at two-dimensional motion for an object that moves in a projectile fashion, okay? And so um, they, they, you know, we're, we're moving beyond the object moving in a straight line to an object that'll, in this particular example of a projectile, be moving in what we call a parabolic path. So now the object can move anywhere on a flat surface or plane as opposed to a straight line. So we need two parameters to describe it. You know, before we were using X or Y. Now we're going to be using X and Y. Okay. So that's what they're telling you here. To describe our object, we need an XY pair. Okay. So um, now <laughs> it might seem at first glance that, hey, this is going to be complicated because we're going to be describing an object that's moving horizontally and vertically. But the nice thing is, for the objects that we're gonna be studying, the horizontal motion and the vertical motion don't affect each other. So it's almost like I got this object that's moving horizontally and vertically, but I can take the horizontal motion and separate it out. I can take the vertical motion and separate it out, okay? And so you can see, for example, in the picture, the object in the red, the red, the red object, is doing free fall because it's falling straight down. The blue object is doing, doing um, horizontal and vertical or 2D motion. The red object is 1D motion, only vertical. The blue object is horizontal and vertical. But the nice thing is for the blue object, we can look at just the vertical motion by itself and just the horizontal motion by itself. So, hey, wait a minute. We already know how to do that. We know how to look at horizontal motion. We know how to look at vertical motion. The only thing is in the back of your mind, you have to keep, keep in mind that both of these things for the blue object are happening simultaneously. But the for the blue object, the vertical motion doesn't affect the horizontal motion and vice versa. They have that you can almost think of it like this blue object is doing, you know, <laughs> kind of having a split personality. It's doing horizontal and vertical, but you can look at them separately. So imagine taking the blue object and at every point along the motion path, looking at what is doing vertically by itself, what is doing horizontally. So we actually already have the tools to do that. 
We have the tools to do that already. So for our projectile, we have to remember that it has horizontal motion and vertical motion, but the vertical motion for our projectile is free fall. Oh wait, we already know how to do free fall. So for the projectile, when you want to, to analyze the vertical motion, go pull out your free fall equation. That's what you use to look at the vertical motion. Well, what about the horizontal motion? The nice thing about the horizontal motion of a projectile is that it does not accelerate. The projectile accelerates vertically because of gravity, but horizontally, there's no acceleration. Well, if there's no acceleration horizontally, that means the projectile can't speed up or slow down horizontally. It means that the velocity in the X direction is constant. As you see here on the screen, the horizontal component of the velocity for our projectile stays fixed. So that makes our life very easily, easy as far as a projectile goes. Because if the velocity is fixed horizontally, then the only thing that can be changing is the distance horizontally. And we know how to find it. We know how to find that. So what I wanna do before we close shop today, don't worry about these formulas on this last page because uh, truly I don't intend for you to use them because those involve trig functions and we're not gonna go there, okay? So before we leave for today, what I wanna do is I want to write out for you for a projectile the equations that you would use to analyze the motion. So, so I'm going to talk about the horizontal first. Because remember, our projectile has horizontal and vertical. So, so Vx is constant. A, X is zero. And that means that X equals V, X, T. Well, let me do that again. That's it. Those are the equations that you need to utilize for a projectile to look at the horizontal motion. Because remember, the projectile does what? Horizontal and vertical, right? What about the vertical motion? Remember, it is in free oh, free fall, okay? And we know what the free fall equations look like. They are what? Y final equals Y, oh, y initial. I'll get it right when in my, my pen dexterity down eventually. 
Y final equals Y initial, yuck, plus V initial T. Minus one half G T squared. V final equals V initial minus G T. And then V final squared. equals V initial square minus two G Y final minus Y initial. So now, remember, you have both of these going on simultaneously, but when you're dealing with the projectile, you can use these equations to analyze the horizontal motion. When you're looking at a projectile, you can use these equations to look at the vertical part of the projectile's motion. The only thing you have to remember is the T that you see here are all the same T. So if you had to solve this equation to get T, and then you can put it in here. Or you can use one of these to get T and put it in here, okay? So when you're looking at projectile motion, the object accelerates because of gravity in the vertical and it maintains a constant velocity in the horizontal because there is no acceleration, all right? So that's what we need to understand when we're dealing with a two-dimensional projectile, okay? So on Monday, we're gonna continue looking at 2D motion and we'll look at our um, circular motion, okay? And, and then, um, you know, I'll extend the deadline on problem set number five until and the discussion until Tuesday. So that way, Monday, after we finish looking at the, the circular motion, you will have some opportunity to finish that, uh, finish that problem set. In fact, I'm gonna leave the discussion there because I think you can get through that. Uh, but problem set five, I'll allow you to ha have until Tuesday. No, wait, no, 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 no. The discussion, Tuesday, the problem set next Saturday. Sorry about that. So, so fo you, you'll have to focus on uh, 1D motion and vectors this weekend, and you'll focus on uh, finishing up the 2D motion stuff uh, next week. Any questions? All right, so I'm going to stop my sharing there. And please, if you have a question, don't hesitate. Just unmute your mic. I'll be happy to address any questions that you might have. If there are no questions, I want to thank you for joining in and your attentiveness this uh, afternoon. Uh, I will post this video as soon as it's captioned. Uh, and I will also post those um, whiteboards in the announcements with the video. All right, y'all have a great weekend. I'll see you back here on Monday. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.